Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. My name is GD Benson. I'm the master of ceremonies, and I'll be working alongside Nelly Kalu. Nelly is an on-air personality at Nigeria Info 99.3. You're Good welcome morning, once again. Good morning, everyone. We'll begin today's event with a rendition of the national anthem. This will be taken by TK. And as TK is available, standing right here on stage with us, we shall all rise. So, TK? And here he is. Let's all rise, please. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. I can, I can feel the excitement in the atmosphere. It's just as if Nigeria won the World Cup. It will happen in my lifetime and in your lifetime. Amen. <laughs> and in your lifetime and in my lifetime, we will celebrate 24 hours of electricity because we will be living well together. Did I hear you say amen? amen. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a lot of recognitions today in no particular order, and it's going to continue all through the course of the event. But first, I'd like to start by recognizing the man for whom we're all gathered today, who put this together. Ladies and gentlemen, your hands together for Pro Professor Pat Utomi. Professor Patutomi is a very successful man in many respects. And as they say, beside every successful man is a beautiful and wonderful woman. Seated next to Professor Otomi is his darling wife, Professor Ifoma Otomi. <laughs> Lagos is working, things are happening, it's transforming right before our very eyes. And the architect of the transformation of the current Lagos state is none other than a chartered accountant, His Excellency, Mr. Akiumi Ambadi. <laughs> Seated next to Governor Ambadi is also a former governor and perhaps the youngest person ever to become a senator in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, your hands together for His Excellency, Senator Liel Imoke. We also have with us this morning the Governor of Enugu State. He's represented by the Honorable Commissioner for Information, Mr. Chidi Aro. Mr. Chidi Aro representing His Excellency. Please rise and take a bow. We also have with us this morning the Speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly, Honor Right Honorable Barrister John Labor. Please stand to be recognized. We also have with us this morning the first female president of the Nigerian Institute of Management, Mrs. Emari Adeleke. Please stand to take a bow. 
also with us, the former Commissioner for Physical Planning in Lagos State, architect Akim Bajabi Amila. Please rise and take a bow, sir. We also have a diplomat extraordinaire and Nigeria's first Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Chief Emeka Anyaoku. Please rise and take a bow. We have the founder and executive chairman of Nigeria's largest advertising group, Troika Holdings, Mr. Biodun Shobanjo. Also with us this morning is the chairman of Emerald Energy Resources and former special advisor to the president of Nigeria on Petroleum Resources, Dr. Emmanuel Egboga. Dr. Egboga, please rise and take a bow. Also with us this morning, ladies and gentlemen, is the founder and CEO of Brilla Media Group, none other than Dr. Larry Izamuji. Also with us this morning is the CEO of ACT Foundation of the Access Bank Group, Ms. Osai Alili. Please rise and take a bow. And the last for this round of recognitions is Senator Gershom Bassi, representing Cross River South in the National Assembly. We will take more recognitions as we proceed in the course of the event. Thank you very much. Today's event is themed, Living Well Together Tomorrow, the challenge of Africa's future, or Africa's future cities. Let me complete the whole thing. This is a very interesting theme because we live in a world where the dynamics of living together in a city has become quite a challenge. Immigration is already scandalous as it is, and people in megacities and metropolis are finding it very hard to deal with various kinds of origins, tribes, nationalities. In fact, the complexity of such a living is a problem we have in the world today. But despite the theme, it is also the birthday, the 61st birthday of the founder and CEO of CVL. And let us stand, let us rise and give him a round of applause as we welcome Professor Pat Utomi to give us a welcome address. Thank you so much, Her Excellency, Governor of Lagos State, I should say Mr. Chairman, Her Excellency, the Governor of Lagos State, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I do have a, a written welcome address, but as many are familiar, uh, that is for the record. This is usually my opportunity uh, to say a thing or two that I hold very dear. The most important thing for me is gratitude. Gratitude to so many who have made the little things we have been able to do possible. I could not possibly begin to list those I owe so much to for the little bit that we have had our opportunity to contribute to, but I owe an enormous, enormous bunch of gratitudes to uh, those who have made today possible. Um, many times we get credit for things we make very little contributions to. I have been called the architect of today. Uh, I did very little, by the way, to make today happen. And so many dedicated friends, the CVL team have worked to make this conversation possible. And it's a very important subject matter in my view that we're about to have this conversation on this morning. And so I owe them a great debt of gratitude. I particularly want to thank Lagos State. I mean, I've repeated at the risk of uh, 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 sounding um, like there's a peculiar point being made here, we owe Lagos State 
a debt of gratitude for example, good example. In my view, perhaps the best governed state in Nigeria in the last 18 years has set for us a sense for Nigeria without and beyond oil. And I think it's a dream that we should live and move forward. I'm particularly excited that the Rockefeller Foundation has found 100 resilient cities in the world. Amongst them, Lagos and the city of Enugu. And our hope is that Enugu will be at the hub of a new Lagos. So that we can see progress broadened in the country. And so I'm thankful for the privilege of being able to have that come to the fore. But let me uh, turn to some small passions that are really uh, pulling at me at this point in, in time. There is an obsession with talking about tertiary education in Nigeria. And yet, what is more important, because if you don't get that right, the quality of tertiary education will be not so right because garbage goes in and only garbage can exit. And this is primary education. Primary education matters for many reasons, including the fact that some of the most learning, I am told by the experts, takes place during those early years. And so this commitment and this belief that we should walk our talk, not only say what is government doing, has led us down a track of something I've mentioned before. They were trying to start two primary schools, one in Nikurudu, one in a place called Ibuzo in Delta State. These primary schools will be for the poorest of the poor, free of charge, with a free meal, and will aim to give better than corona quality education to the children of the poorest of the poor. If we can add strong values curriculum, strong design and tech curriculum, and if we can add strong leadership curriculum, we believe that the problems of social mobility, and many of us seem to be oblivious of a growing danger of a society where we could have a permanent underclass. Social mobility, because of the quality of education, is not taking place as it should take place. Our hope is that that kind of effort will help begin to change this. I'm sure many of you are familiar with my work with AFED, the Association for Formidable Education Development, which is a group of private schools in slum areas, who, by the way, account for more than 60% of the education taking place in a city like Lagos today, and that we work with those kinds of people to transform lives at that level is a very, very important thing. And I would like, and Professor Kohli and I were talking about this yesterday night, to pay tribute to a British academic called Tully, Professor James Tully, who has been trying to excite our focus on that. The day he walked into my office, I felt ashamed that it would take somebody from England to come and tell me about what is happening in my backyard. So uh, that is a very important thing uh, for us. And finally, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of young people amongst us. Uh, usually we have four or 500 executives and senior people at these meetings, but it does not matter until we can get the young people to begin to understand early what leadership means. The leadership That leadership is other-centered behavior, not about self. If you look in the mirror and all you see is you, you are not a leader. Leadership is sacrificial giving of oneself for the advance of the common good. 
And our hope is that we be, as we bring these younger people to begin to learn what is important, they will get away from this phenomenon in our collapse of culture in which life is about finding money that you do not need, to buy things you do not want, to please neighbors you do not like and focus on more elevating things that can truly make you immortal. People to remember you long after you've gone. So I think with those words, I'd like to close with a tribute to somebody who passed on just in the last two weeks, who grew up here in Lagos, but whose house is across from mine in Ibuzo at 16, she became a child bride and moved to the UK. At age 22, she had five children already and left an abusive marriage and became a great writer, educated herself, educated her children. My tribute to Buchi Emecheta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Otomi. I'll take another round of recognitions at this time and then move on to the next item on the program. We have with us the representative of the governor of Cross River State, the Honorable Commissioner for New Cities Development, Barrister George Ekpungu. Please rise and take a bow, Barrister George Ekpungu. We have with us one of a number of the panelists are here. I'd like to recognize them. Dr. Fred Olale is the president of Global Economic Institute of Africa, based in Toronto, Canada. Please rise and take a bow. <laughs> Mrs. Udo Okonjo is the CEO of Fine and Country International West Africa. Please rise and take a bow. <laughs> Dr. Taibat Lawansin. Associate Professor, Department of Urban and Regional Planning, University of Lagos. We also have with us this morning, the Managing Director of Smart City Lagos and President Udemba Group, Chief Uzo Udemba. And last but not the least for this round of recognitions, we have all the way from India, Anurag Arora, is a senior faculty of the Art of Living Foundation in India. I'll now invite the chairman of today's occasion for his opening remarks. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency, former governor of Cross River State, Senator Liel Imoke. Thank you very much. Um, let me start with the proper recognition of His Excellency, the Governor of Lagos State, Governor Akiumi Ambode. Let me also recognize and congratulate Professor Patutomi on his 61st birthday, and of course, much beyond that, uh, for providing leadership um, to a lot of us who have looked up to him over the years and of course to this foundation which is focused primarily on leadership. Um, I have a great passion for leadership and um, I also have a similar foundation called the Bridge Leadership Foundation. One day we hope to grow to be as big as CVL. Um, let me also recognize very distinguished personalities here, um, some who have already been duly recognized by the um, Master of Ceremonies. Professor Collier, um, who is our keynote speaker for today, is an authority on many subjects on Africa, but today we're going to be discussing 
something that I think is going to be an issue moving forward. Over the last few years, we've had various policies, various theories on urbanization, rural migration, moving back to the villages, moving back to the farms, moving up to the cities, and growing the cities. And in recent times, urbanization, which appeared to be something that wasn't so good, now seems to be the driver for the future of development in Africa. If that is the case, as has been propounded by a number of uh, Collier presentations and similar presentations, then the challenge for us first is coming to terms with our present realities. And as Professor Patitomi stated, Lagos presents to us a model that we can look at, not just here in Lagos State, but really in Nigeria, on what the benefits that accrue from urbanization or migration from rural areas to urban areas um, could possibly be, but also the tremendous challenges that we will face in managing this mass movement, as it were. Professor Coley estimates that by 2015, 2050, uh, migration to urban areas would have tripled. Growths would be rising at six times what it is and what it has been at the past. And unfortunately, the money and the investment that goes with that is not there. And this calls for a certain amount of creativity. And of course, this also presents to the, or brings to the fore many more challenges that we're going to face. Uh, we've talked about relationship challenges. We've talked about, or we will talk about, I believe, infrastructure challenges. Um, finance policy challenges and the role of government, the role of private sector in addressing these challenges. I want to thank the organizers of this event for choosing this particular subject matter for discussion. I also want to thank the governor of Lagos State whose presence here today is key for us. Um, for those of us who used to live in Lagos, and left Lagos to more rural environments um, many years back. Um, we come back to Lagos and we see Lagos differently um, from when we left it. And um, even as a politician, uh, we tend to be given to flattery. But I, do, I dare say, uh, it wouldn't be flattery if we commend Governor Mbode on the work that he has continued to do and is doing here in Lagos State. <laughs> One of the challenges that Professor Collier has not emphasized, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about it, is the challenge of continuity. It makes such a difference in governance when policies, regulations, legislation, and support are constant and consistent. When governments transit and everything does not collapse because a new governor or a new sheriff is in town. And I think Lagos presents itself as a model um, of that continuity. Uh, on our own part in Cross River, uh, coming what we call, what I, uh, I like to call provincial governments, uh, taking decisions on investment and of course being visionary enough 
um, to project and invest in the right infrastructure, invest in congestion, because um, the bottom line today is we grew up being told that it was nice to have a home with a green lawn. And everybody now says, no, there isn't enough connectivity. You need to be in a dense population, in a high rise, and all the services provided, and you grow your economy. Now, that is far from what I was taught in school. And probably that is why it's good that we have the younger people here listening to a different theory, a different approach, and a different strategy to urbanization and to growth, and ultimately to economic development. The focus for today, I believe, would be on not just what it takes, but the impact on our economies. Um, in my past life, I was speaking to someone yesterday and I said, 40% of the electricity generated in Nigeria is delivered to Lagos State, or should be delivered to Lagos State, an absolute minimum. But if I did that, and when I tried to deliver 40%, it became a political issue. Why is Lagos getting 40% when Sokoto, Calabar, and Yola are not getting 40% of their total available electricity supply. Now, Lagos got 40% of the electricity, but delivered 55% of the total revenues uh, to the utility. So clearly, that investment that was made at a national level, not necessarily all by Lagos State, was a policy decision which had to be taken, but which faced many challenges and ultimately I'm not sure whether 40% of the total available electricity in Nigeria today is still being delivered uh, to Lagos State. So there are a number of issues that I believe will be discussed in these sessions. And I think for us who are here, we should all look forward to very, very robust and interesting presentations. I'm looking forward to uh, listening to the renowned professor and the various speakers. So again, I'd like to welcome all of you um, to this session, and I believe that it will be of tremendous benefit. Please enjoy it, and thank you, CVL, for putting this together. Another round of applause, please, for Senator Lyon. Continuing a round of recognitions, we have representing His Excellency, Mr. Godwin Obasiki, Governor of Edo State, representing him is His Excellency, retired Honorable Philip Shwaib, Deputy Governor of Edo State and Digital Youth Leader. Also, we have Taiwo Akerele, the Chief of Staff to Edo State Government and Civil Board Member, also the youngest Chief of Staff in Nigeria. Please rise for a round of applause. Well, I can't see him, and I wanted to see the youngest chief of staff in Nigeria. Oh, well, I missed my chance. Okay. Now, I grew up in Lagos, and growing up in Lagos, people can count several things my generation had never seen, like 24-hour light, power in general. But there are some advantages growing up in Lagos. I grew up to not exactly identify with any geopolitical region. I grew up to see everyone as my neighbor, quite the same thing as our host today, Professor Patutomi. You grew up in a city like this, you see everything the same. There's no language barrier, there's no tribal barrier, there is absolutely no barrier whatsoever. So imagine my shock when cities that I should aspire to are having the same issues in this time. But let's not lose faith, because about 20 years ago, a very inspiring young lady said something about the theme of today. Just a reminder, the theme is living well together tomorrow, the challenge of Africa's future cities, and one of them, Lagos, another, Enugu, and many more cities that will be springing up in Nigeria. 
There is a short inspirational video for us to hear exactly what she said because those things are still quite relevant today. Please enjoy. Hello, I'm Severin Suzuki speaking for ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization. We're a group of 12 and 13 year olds trying to make a difference. Vanessa Setti, Morgan Geisler, Michelle Quigg, and me. We've raised all the money to come here ourselves, to come 5,000 miles to tell you adults you must change your ways. Coming up here today, I have no hidden agenda. I am fighting for my future. Losing my future is not like losing an election or a few points on the stock market. I am here to speak for all generations to come. I am here to speak speak on behalf of the starving children around the world whose cries go unheard. I am here to speak for the countless animals dying across this planet because they have nowhere left to go. I am afraid to go out in the sun now because of the holes in our ozone. I am afraid to breathe the air because I don't know what chemicals are in it. I used to go in I used to go fishing in Vancouver, my home, with my dad, until just a few years ago we found the fish full of cancers. And now we hear of animals and plants going extinct every day, vanishing forever. In my life, I have dreamt of seeing the great herds of wild animals, jungles and rainforests full of birds and butterflies, but now I wonder if they will even exist for my children to see. Did you have to worry of these things when you were my age? All this is happening before our eyes and yet we act as if we have all the time we want and all the solutions. I'm only a child and I don't have all the solutions. But I, don't, I want you to realize neither do you. You don't know how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. If you don't know how to fix it, please stop breaking it. Here, you may be delegates of your government, business people, organizers, reporters, or politicians, but really, your mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles, and all of you are someone's child. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all part of a family, five billion strong, in fact, 30 million species strong, and borders and governments will never change that. I'm only a child, yet I know we are all in this together, and should act as one single world towards one single goal. In, in my anger, I am not blind, and in my fear, I am not afraid of telling the world how I feel. In my country, we make so much waste. We buy and throw away, buy and throw away, buy and throw away, and yet northern countries will not share with the needy. Even when we have more than enough, we are afraid to share, we are afraid to let go of some of our wealth. In Canada, we live the privileged life with plenty of food, water, and shelter. We have watches, bicycles, computers, and television sets. The list could go on for two days. Two days ago here in Brazil, we were shocked when we spent time with some children living on the streets. This is what one child told us. I wish I was rich. And if I were, I would give all the street children food, clothes, medicines, shelter, and love and affection. If a child on the streets who has nothing is willing to share, why are we who have everything still so greedy? I can't stop thinking that these are children my own age, that it makes a tremendous difference where you are born that I could be one of those children living in the favelas of Rio. I could be a child starving in Somalia, or a victim of war 
in the Middle East or a beggar in India. I am only a child, yet I know if all the money spent on war was spent on finding environmental answers, ending poverty, and finding treaties, what a wonderful place this earth would be. At school, even in kindergarten, you teach us how to behave in the world. You teach us to not to fight with others, to work things out, to respect others, to clean up our mess, not to hurt other creatures, to share, not be greedy. Then why do you go out and do the, uh, do the things you tell us not to do? Do not forget why you are attending these conferences, who you're doing this for. We are your own children. You are deciding what kind of a world we are growing up in. Parents should be able to comfort their children by saying, everything's going to be all right. It's not the end of the world, and we're, and we're doing the best we can. But I don't think you can say that to us anymore. Are we even on your list of priorities? My dad always says, you are what you do, not what you say. Well, what you do makes me cry at night. You grown-ups say you love us. But I challenge you, please, make your actions reflect your words. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I promise not to bore you today with recognitions. But you know we live in a society where everybody must be accorded recognition, even if they arrive two minutes to the end of a program. So you please oblige me as I take another round of recognitions. We have with us the moderator of the panel that will take place later this morning. He's a special advisor to the Governor of Lagos State on Overseas Affairs, Professor Ademola Abbas. Please rise and take a bow, Professor Abbas. Thank you. We have also the Managing Director of Private Estates International West Africa, Mr. Kingsley Eze. Mr. Eze, please rise and take a bow. Also with us this morning is the sales director of Lafarge Leading Cement Company, Marlene Kinefo, I'm sorry, Zunon. Sales director of Lafarge, Marlene Kinefo Zunon. Please rise and take a bow wherever you are. We also have Mr. Femi Oye. He's the co-founder of SME Funds. Please rise and take a bow. And the group managing director of FBN Holdings, Mr. UK AK. You're welcome, sir. I'd now invite Isioma Otomi to give us the citation of our next speaker. Please put your hands together for Isioma. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my name is Isioma Otomi, and I am honored to be introducing our keynote speaker today for the 14th CVL Annual Lecture International Leadership Symposium. African folklore in some parts of the continent links sneezing to a person being mentioned somewhere. If that were literally true, our keynote speaker must surely sneeze a lot given how frequently my father alone mentions him. <laughs> my father mentions his name in several circumstances, but his name typically comes up when discussing why growth has been slow in Africa. Dad cites those who blame geography as being wrong in their conclusion, and typically sides with our guest speaker that Africa is growing slowly because African leaders are making the wrong policy choices. The other issue around which my dad must be responsible for much sneezing on, is on manufacturing strategy. He recalls that our guest speaker, as a researcher from Oxford University, visited while he was an executive as Volkswagen of Nigeria nearly 30 years ago. He particularly takes delight in making the point that a quarter of a century later, Unido asked the guest speaker to study China's dramatic ascendance in manufacturing to draw out lessons for Africa. 
the guest speaker's telling illustration of how one local government manufactures nearly three quarters of all the buttons we wear in the world would be proof to his view that Nigeria was better off becoming a producer of select components, which would allow it to dominate input supplies in the global production of cars, rather than trying to produce cars in uncompetitive situations. Our guest speaker is Sir Paul Collier, Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for the Study of African Economies at Oxford University. He has served as Director of Development Research at the World Bank and advisor to the British Government's Commission on Africa. Professor Collier, whose recent research has focused our attention on cities as, a, as an economic phenomenon, has been described by another British scholar my father is very fond of, Neil Ferguson, as the authentic old Africa hand. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you a, a man a Nigerian diplomat once said was entitled to a Nigerian passport for work and interests, Professor Paul Collier. Thank you very much. If, um, if, uh, if the speech by the 12-year-old wasn't daunting enough, um, that introduction certainly was. Um, rather. Um, let, let me f just start by uh, thanking this invitation. It, it's, both a, it's both an honor and a pleasure um, to speak before before Governor Ambodi, before Senator Imoki, and before my friend and colleague, Professor Atomi, uh, is, is a delight. Um, but um, there are an awful lot of distinguished, clever Nigerians. And so to, to put somebody on, like me on the stage, um, there's only one excuse, uh, and that is if I say something that is helpful. Um, and that's what I'm going to try and do. Right? So bear with me. Um, most speakers deluge you with PowerPoints. I, I never use PowerPoints. Um, you're, you're supposed to listen. Right? Um, and. Uh, and if that doesn't work, think of something else. Right? Um, the, um, now, um, Senator Moki, and I, I, I was very impressed. He'd, he'd actually read my stuff, and he stole my starting line, um, which was that between now and 2050, uh, Africa's urban population will triple. Right? That means two-thirds of your cities are not built. That's a huge opportunity to get the future right. Huge. Right? But if you don't get it right, you'll build a nightmare. Right? You've got a choice. People are going to live in cities, big cities. Right? Lagos already a mega city. It's going to get even bigger. Right? Um, that, I'm going to try and explain to you, that is a huge opportunity. It's very good news. Right? But it has a downside risk, which is obvious. Right? You could end up with a mega slum. Right? Urbanization is an area where public policy choices are absolutely vital. Right? Start now, because two thirds of your cities are not built. Right? Start now, get it right. right? You can build good 21st century cities. Um, let me pan into Nigeria and say, you know, all my working life, Nigeria has been cursed by oil. Yeah? And it has, in all honesty, it has messed your economy up. Yeah? And the fall in the oil price, viewed long term, is a huge opportunity for you. In particular, it's a huge opportunity for Lagos. You are going through, at the moment, the agony of adjustment. Yeah? Adjustment externally, 
getting the exchange rate right instead of banning this and banning that, and internally getting the fiscal balance right. You know, 70% of Nigeria's fiscal revenues were oil. Tax of the non-oil economy was only 3% of GDP. In my country, Britain, tax is 37% of GDP. You know, so yes, there'll be painful adjustments, right? But once you've gone through that adjustment, and it won't take long, you will find yourselves in a wonderful position because Lagos has huge opportunities. Globally, the future will be dominated by coastal megacities. Coastal, because you've got to be able to integrate into the world economy, and megacities for reasons that this lecture is going to try and explain. You've, not only are you a coastal megacity, you've got a vast hinterland. Nigeria is Africa's big country, and so you've no border barriers that stop Lagos benefiting not just an immediate hinterland, but the whole nation. Um, you are already the fastest growing megacity in the world. Right? This is a huge opportunity that you stand before. How do you do it? Right? How? Well, the, the, the key to good policy is a golden alliance a golden alliance between the business community, here you are, and what I call the authorizing political environment. And here is the governor. And let me just say, I believe that Governor Ambodi is the third excellent governor in a row in Lagos. I have been coming to Lagos for 30 years, and it is already transformed. It is going to be more transformed, but you're already on exactly the right path. So you need a business community allied with a local political authorizing environment. You are extremely lucky that your any megacity needs a unified authorizing environment that has a spatial span of control that covers the city and its hinterland. Because megacities grow, most of them do not have such an authorizing environment. A lot of African cities have several mayors and a very confused power structure between the local and the national. Fortuitously, Lagos State has a span of control and a level of authority which is appropriate for the megacity which is located in the state. You've got your authorizing environment right, and that is true of very few megacities globally. Right? So you start from a good position. You also need an alliance with the federal level because there are some things that the federal level has to get right. And so that is the golden alliance. The local business community, the authorizing environment of Lagos State, and enough links in liaison with the federal government that it does things which are helpful rather than counterproductive. So now let me get into the substance of what I've got to say, which is building a city that works. What I mean by a city that works is two things. It's going to be productive and it's going to be livable. I'm going to start with productive. And I'm going to start with a bit of economics. No apology. And we, we start with something called the miracle of productivity. And the miracle of productivity is what transforms ordinary people 
from being unproductive, desperately poor, which has been the, the, the fate of almost all mankind until a couple of hundred years ago, suddenly 200 years ago, something new happened that transformed ordinary people, ordinary peasants coming in from the farms, working in factories, it was first seen by Adam Smith. And he was astounded. That's what his book, The Wealth of Nations, was about. He couldn't believe what was happening before his eyes. What was happening before his eyes was people came together at scale and therefore could specialize on different things in the same organization. And scale and specialization made people dramatically more productive. Not by 10%, but 10 times or 100 times. This is what transforms the society, lifts people out of poverty like a rocket, scale and specialization. But scale and specialization needs, it can only happen on platforms that make it feasible. And that platform is a city. Scale and specialization don't happen everywhere. They happen in cities and not every city. So what does the platform of a, of a city that works provide that enables scale and specialization? Basically, two things. They're not complicated. Energy and connectivity. Without energy, you can't be productive. Without connectivity, people can't come together and communicate. So energy and connectivity. I'll say a few words. In each case, energy and connectivity require some infrastructure and some services. A stock of infrastructure and a flow of services. I'll say a few words about energy and then much more about connectivity. Energy. Um, you haven't got it. Um, it's not complicated to get energy. Right? There's probably been too much focus in Nigeria on generation and not enough on transmission. The real bottleneck is transmission, the service of transmission. One of the problems is people are reluctant to pay. If people are reluctant to pay when they take it off the grid, other people are reluctant to put it in the grid. Right? Um, there's new technologies. Embrace new technologies. Prepay. Lots of new technologies are going to be your friend all along the line in urbanization. Right? So enough about electricity. Um, but let me turn in more detail to connectivity. Connectivity is a lot more complicated than energy. Um, connectivity depends upon two things. To show you, I'm going to have to put this microphone down for a moment. Okay. Uh, I don't, hopefully you can still hear me. Suppose you want to connect my left hand and my right hand. There are two things I can do, both sensible. Okay? One is build a link between my left hand and my right hand. That's called transport infrastructure. The other thing I could do, anybody think? I could move them closer together. That's called density. Transport links and density. That's the vital ingredients into connectivity. Let's say something about transport links. Then we'll turn to density. Transport links. Well, partly because you're a global megacity, think international transport links. Your port has to work. Your airport has to work. I must say, coming into Lagos Airport last night for probably the hundredth time in 30 years, You've made very good progress on your airport, right? 
I wish I could say the same about Heathrow, <laughs> which some of you have doubtless experienced. Um, so, international, think international, but then within the city, think transport for mass movement. You, nearly all of you, got here today in individual cars. That is not a viable means of transport in a megacity. Okay? Individual cars stuck in a line down a street are equivalent to digging that street up. You've jammed up the street. Okay? You might as well not have built it. Right? And so you have to decongest roads. You need a lot of roads. As a city gets bigger, a higher and higher proportion of the center of the city needs to be roads. Obvious if you think about it for a moment. Right? More people are trying to get into the center. You'll need a higher proportion of that central city area as roads. But if you depend on cars, you will just destroy the roads. They'll just be traffic jams. Right? negative roads. Right? So you've got to think of transport en masse and uh, the, the best technology is probably some form of buses in some way. Right? Buses, trams, trains, something like that. Right? And that means privileging mass transport over individual transport. Right? Privileging one over the other, that's part of good public policy. You want to subsidize buses, tax cars. You want to give privileged road space to buses. Right? Ban cars from some areas. My own little city of Oxford, which is, what, about one two hundredth of Lagos, um, has bus lanes. Bus lanes, right? You know, if I drove my car in a bus lane, I'd be fined. Right? That's privilege the mass over the individual because it's the individual is completely unviable, cannot possibly work in a megacity. Right? The only megacities where cars sort of work, Los Angeles, for example. Right? Los Angeles does it by not having a center at all and by having a massive investment in low density um, highways. Even so, it's deeply dysfunctional. Right? Your finance minister is just there today. Right? Um, there isn't a center in Los Angeles. Right? There's no way that you're going to build Lagos like that. Right? Lagos is going to look something like London, Paris, yeah. the great cities of the 19th century, you'll be the great city of the 21st century, <laughs> and it will be based upon viable means of mass transport. Um, let me say a little bit about, um, about density. And Density, um, which is about the, the built environment, what buildings, what sort of buildings go, go up in the city, um, and uh, um, indeed, as, uh, as Senator Imoki said, um, you know, the dream of everybody living in a nice big house with a big green garden, um, if that's what you want, go to a small town. Right? It's just not a practical menu for a megacity. Yeah. It's just not practical. Yeah. Even the most powerful man in the world, President Trump, <laughs> famously, he lives in New York right, in an apartment, right? That's, you know, it's all fancy, it's got gilt pillars everywhere and so on, but it's an apartment, right? He's a billionaire living in an apartment, 
right? If you're going to live in Lagos, think apartments. Right? If it's good enough for a billionaire, it's good enough, for, you know. Um, okay. Um, now, um, the first step in getting a, a, a sensible degree of density in a city is the land market, is land. How do people get land? Right? And there are three attributes of urban land that are absolutely vital. Right? One is whoever owns the land needs to have secure ownership. Without secure ownership, people will be crazy to build on it. Right? So secure ownership. Second, it needs to be legally enforceable. That's a distinct thing from secure. Legally enforceable is the vital step which enables ownership of land to function as collateral in financial markets. That means I own land, I can pledge it to a bank, and the bank will lend me money because the bank can always secure that ownership if I default. Right? That ability to combine finance with land is vital if you're going to build buildings on it. Right? So secure, legally enforceable title, and then the third feature is marketable. Marketable, ability to sell it and buy it. Why does marketability matter? Because as the city grows, the use of land is going to change a lot, a lot. Right? Cities are dynamic. If the use of land has to change a lot, the owners of that land have to change a lot. But ownership can only change if the land is readily marketable. The key step in marketability is land's got to be easy to value. So, those are the three vital aspects of land. Secure title, legally enforceable, marketable. Right? How much of the land in urban Lagos state already has those characteristics? I don't know, you will know. Right? Um, if you've not got it, how do you get it? It's really pretty easy. Right? Um, last few years I've been working with the, uh, the government of Rwanda. Um, Rwanda started 20 odd years ago with the ultimate nightmare. Post-genocide, densely populated, landlocked, no natural resources, just a nightmare. Right? Been the fastest growing country in Africa. What did they do? They registered the land. Right? They actually registered the whole land in the nation, but you don't need to do anything as ambitious as that. Just register the land, the urban land. Get a clear land registry, which will serve as security of title, collateral, and um, marketability. You know? will also serve as something else we'll come back to. Right? But a land registry, absolutely vital. In Rwanda, it cost uh, $6 per parcel to register the land. So it's not wildly expensive. Ethiopia's just done the same thing, and there they managed to do it even more cheaply, $1 a parcel. So we're not talking big money. No? This is not a really expensive thing to do. It was also, in both countries, it was done really fast. I sat down, had dinner with the, the Chief Justice of, uh, of Ghana about three or four years ago, and I sort of gave him this spiel about the importance of 
clear land rights. And he said, oh, you know, in Ghana we haven't got clear land rights. Um, we lawyers, we've been working on it for the last 50 years. It's really complicated. And the implication was that they'd need at least another 50 years before the lawyers sorted it out. Right? The, the message from that is, don't leave this to the lawyers. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is economically vital. This is first order economic development. Right? You can't leave it to the agony of individual law lawyers arguing in individual courts about individual plots of land. You get a register. Yeah. You use political authority to force it through. Flush out the, um, the, 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 the multiple claims for ownership. A good way of doing that is by having a closure date. If you don't declare ownership by this date, forget it. Right? If there are multiple claims for a parcel, you have a fast-track way, way of sorting it out. Okay, so you do the land. Then we get to the technologies of the, uh, of the transport links and the density. And we can think of them as a sort of hierarchy of pairs of technologies. Um, the typical African city do you know the technology that most people use to get to work in the typical African city? You're not most people. This is not a typical African city. But imagine, typical African city, typical person. How do they get to work? Feet. They walk, right? They walk, right? That's the most common way of getting to work in Nairobi. You walk for an hour in Nairobi, you can reach 6% of the city's jobs. Right? Totally fragmented labor market because there's no adequate transport connectivity. Right? One up from feet is buses. Right? Now you can get more or less fancy with buses. You can do individual private minibuses. You can do bus lanes you can do bus rapid transit. But buses are the most important technology for moving thousands, millions of people to work. That's the efficient mode of transport. Then one up from buses, light rail, you're doing light rail, and at the top of the heap, um, you know, what do you use when you go to London? The underground, the metro. Right? Um, you weigh, you weigh, don't, don't do a metro, right? It's just too expensive for the moment. It's too expensive, right? And here's a very important point. The appropriate technologies for transport have to match the technologies you've got for density. A metro system only works once you've got very high residential density because then there are thousands of people within e easy reach of a metro station. Yeah? Dar es Salaam is doing bus rapid transit at the moment, and my fear is that it will never be financially viable, or at least not for a long time, because Dar es Salaam, the technology of residential accommodation in Dar es Salaam is the one-story shack. And so you just don't have the density needed even for bus rapid transit. Right? So as you move up the hierarchy of transport technologies, you need to move up the hierarchy of residential accommodation, moving from the one-story shack to the, the three-story townhouse, the four- or five-story apartment block, Seldom more than that, seldom more than four or five story, because four or five story you can work just with a staircase. When you get higher than that, you need a lift and an ele elevator, and that is a quantum leap in costs. So if you look at the efficient 19th century cities of Europe, Budapest, Paris, London, they were basically three, four, five story cities. And that's, that's kind of what you should be, be, you know, it's great, incidentally, the young people in the, in the audience. 
It's very hard to believe, but I was young once. And, um, but where, as you grow up, the city that should emerge before your eyes is that sort of three, four, five-story cities, you know? Um, now, um, what sort of three, four, five-story? It's got to be affordable. It's got to be affordable for ordinary people. The terrible mistake made by efforts to do sort of affordable housing is that it starts, and forgive me architects in the room, but it starts from what architects would like to build. I, um, about four years ago, I had dinner with um, the Italian architects who'd been hired to do the grand plan for Dar es Salaam. And um, they explained their plan. It gradually dawned on me that this was a plan for 20% of the people in Dar es Salaam. So I eventually plucked up courage to say, what about the other 80%? And you know, they, they hadn't thought about that. So I started explaining what affordable housing would mean and what it would look like. And they went and discussed it amongst themselves. And then they came back to me and said, no, no. Uh, why not? No, we're not going to do that. It would look ugly. That's the priority of Italian architects. They wanted to win this Venice Architecture Prize or something. Right? That, that is architects, right? Forgive me, right? not all architects. But, um, but the point is, you can't start from what you'd like to live in or what you'd like to build. Right? You start from what people can afford. You work from household budget information, and affordability also depends on what the financial sector can do. Affordable mortgages. In Africa, only 3% of the population has mortgages. That's shocking, right? Building societies were invented by poor people in Britain over 200 years ago to service poor people. Right? When I was a kid, my mother opened a little savings account for me in the local building society, and I, you know, I put my money in bit by week by week, and all that aggregated savings was then lent very cheaply to other people like my own family, right, who were able to borrow at really very modest interest rates because then inflation was low. If inflation's high, you need to borrow indexed, so your financial sector needs to innovate to think, what can we do that makes the annual repayments affordable? You know? The average interest rate charged on mortgages in Africa is around 23%. That's crazy. You know? People are paying back the mortgage in just a few years. You, know? you need things where it's stretched over a 20-year horizon with low interest rates, maybe offset by um, an inflation indexed uh, capital sum. Um, so, we've done, um, so we've done transport links, we've done, um, uh, we've done housing, affordable housing and density, the density that comes with it. Let me turn next to livability and then finally, just to give you the structure of the talk, both the productivity that I've talked about, the platform for productivity, and a livable city require public money. The governor knows that. He's sitting there thinking, it's all very well for him. He's just a professor who's going to fly home. I'm the guy who's got to face these raised expectations and I haven't got the money. And so my final part of my talk, sir, is for you. It's about how to raise more money from these people and why, if you do it, they'll be pleased. Okay. Um, so let's turn to, to this new block on livability. A good city should not just make people productive at work, 
but it should make life more livable than if they had stayed on the farm. So not just more income, but more livable. And the heart of that is not everybody has a big garden. As I said, that's not on the menu. So what does livability in a city mean? It means good services. Good services. And there are there are actually some infrastructure needs and some running public service needs. So let me start with some key infrastructure. And sure, this is expensive. Um, one of my ancestors um, was the, uh, the mayor of Bradford in 1849. Bradford was at that time the most prosperous and fastest growing city in Europe. Um, it was the, the miracle city of, it, of its time, based around textiles. And my ancestor, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to announce the arrival of His Imperial Majesty, the Orni of Ife, Oba Enito Ogosi. Shall we please rise to welcome His Imperial Majesty, Oba Alayinua. Kabisi, you're welcome. Thank you very much. You may please be seated. Can you see? You're welcome, sir. Can you see? You still want to? You walked in in the middle of the presentation, and the speaker has ask for a special opportunity to get acquainted with you. So that's <laughs> Professor Collier. I'm sure that before long, you do a feature on Oshubo or Ileife. So you want to give him a traditional title? Not today. OK. You can come back and continue.
Your Highness, Your Highness, having been knighted by the Queen of England, I uh, very much appreciate the honour of your presence. So thank you. So, we, we were discussing, or I was trying to discuss, the, um, the importance of livability in a city. And um, I was going to tell you the dangers of, um, of not getting livability right. And I was telling you the story of my own ancestor, who was the mayor of Bradford, the the most prosperous city in Europe in 1849. What struck him in Bradford was cholera. And thousands upon thousands of people died. He was in this position of responsibility as mayor, and he did not know what to do, because nobody knew what caused cholera. We do now. It's water. It's water. At the time my ancestor was mayor of Bradford, people thought it was something to do with the air. Hence the name malaria, bad air. It's water. What you have to do to stop the risks of cholera and other related diseases you have to separate drinking water from sewage. It is a vital matter, and the only way to do that is the infrastructure. You need the infrastructure which pipes water to individual homes, and you need the infrastructure which pipes sewage away from individual homes. And that is expensive. There's no getting away from it, it's expensive, but if you don't do it, you are living dangerously. I often think, what, a, what was my ancestor going through, being responsible and not having any policy leaders that he could call? Policy makers nowadays in cities are not in that position. The leaders are there. You just have to call. And so, separation of water from sewage. The other bit of infrastructure that is very important in cities is street lighting. Health comes from water and sewage. Safety comes from street lighting. And then in complementing that infrastructure are two key services. One service is education. And Professor Atomi already spoke of the, the vital nature of good quality primary education. The key word there is actually quality. It's one thing to get children sitting in a school, it's another to get ideas in their heads. That depends on good teaching. I was the first generation in my family to receive anything other than most elementary education. My mother and father both left school when they were only 12 years old. I went to very ordinary state schools, but they were staffed by teachers who had internalized the mission, the objective of the schools, which was to drag little brats like me up the foothills of the wonderful world of knowledge. And they did. In some schools in Africa, in some schools in Nigeria, teachers don't show up in the class, or they stand before the class, but they couldn't do well on the tests that you children have to take. If your teachers can't do well, how on earth do they expect you to do? Right? So, the vital matter with all public services, like teaching, is internalizing the objectives. You have to get the staff to, to motivated by the objective. And that is the core business of leadership. Exactly the same is true of the police service. You know? 
unmotivated police can become a problem instead of an asset. So, how does leadership build internalization, get people to buy into the mission, and basically leadership has to walk the talk. And three governors in a row in Lagos have done that. But you have to live what you say. You have to set by example. Um, you can also build accountability. Accountability of individuals. Um, I've worked with President Kagame in Rwanda. Every year he brings together his top 200 public officials for a three-day meeting. It's not fancy, it's held in an army camp. And he eats the same army food as everybody else. I've been there, I've done it. And in turn, those 200 people have to stand up and say, yes, this was my objective for this year. This was the clear, quantitative objective I had. Did I meet it? Yes. Did I not meet it? This is why I didn't meet it. And these are the lessons learned. If there's good lessons you've learned, failure is correlated. If there, if there are not good reasons for failure, failure is punished. Tough. So, walk the talk, accountability, and delegation. Leaders should not try and micromanage. That way you get swamped. Um, let me pass finally to, to the, the last block of my talk, which is that both a livable city and a productive city require big public money to be spent. On the roads, on the sewage systems, and so on, all the infrastructure that makes the city productive and livable. And that creates a chicken and an egg problem. You need to spend the money in order to make the city productive, and only if the city becomes productive can people afford to pay for it. How do you resolve the chicken and an egg problem? You borrow. Well, the only problem we're trying to borrow is will people lend you the money? Okay. And it's no good saying, trust me, you know? people don't. Um, and so, how do you build a, 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 an environment in which people are willing to lend you their money at a sensible interest rate? And the answer is, you build that tax system so that, you, so that the, the lender can be confident that you've got a revenue stream which is going to pay back the debt. Where do you get the taxes? And here um, I'm going to suggest just a few things. The key things to tax are not the activity which takes place in the city. You can tax the activity a bit, but when you tax activity, you tend to get less activity. It discourages activity. Huh? You want more activity in Lagos, not less. So what can you tax that doesn't discourage activity? You tax land and buildings. Land and buildings. This links me back to the point I made earlier, that in order to develop a land market and secure land title, you need a public register of land. Once you've got a public register of land, it will double up as a taxation device. If you're not paying tax, you don't own it. It's that simple. There's the enforcement. Huh? If you want to claim ownership, you've got to validate it by paying tax. Um, you can tax both land and buildings. It's not either or. London, in the 19th century, didn't get this right. Above all, it didn't tax land and the appreciation of land. The measure of that is that by the 20th century, the richest man in Britain was the Duke of Westminster. The Duke of Westminster 
was the first billionaire in Britain. Why was he a millionaire? What had he done? What he'd done was very simple, nothing. <laughs> Why was he the richest man in Britain? Because sometime in the 15th century, somebody had given one of his ancestors, or probably one of his ancestors had acquired, let us say, um, the land uh, that is central London. Other people then built on that land, rented from him, and that land, because you got an agglomeration, that land became hugely valuable, so the rents could be hugely high, and so he became a billionaire. He hadn't earned a single pound of that. It had been earned by the agglomeration of London, achieved by the political authorising environment that made London happen. But the political authorising environment failed to capture any of that land appreciation. That was stupid. Right? Don't be that stupid. You don't need to be stupid. The model here for getting it right um, is not 19th century London, which didn't. It's 21st century China. 21st century China has built pretty functional cities very fast. And the core financing model is that the city government captures the value of the appreciation in land. As the land value rises, it gradually sells it off, and that finances the infrastructure. As I say, you've got a chicken and egg problem, but you solve it by putting in that tax system in place. As the land appreciates, you capture enough value that people know they can safely lend you the money. Um, let me end with, um, with both a, an advert and an offer. Um, I, for, for, for 10 years, from about 2000 to about 2010, I thought the vital, the vital policy battle in Africa was natural resources. I, that was, there was a commodity boom, and getting natural resource management right was vital, and so I put all my energies into that. That's over. It's history. Huh? The last few years, I've been putting all my energies into the next battle, the battle that will be fought between now and 2050, getting urbanization right. And so, together with a consortium, I founded a uh, an organization called Cities That Work. Cities That Work is under the auspices of the International Growth Centre, which I think some of you are already familiar with. It's a network between scholars on the one hand and practitioners on the other. So there's a council. The chair of that council is Professor Edward Glazer. Professor Glazer is the most eminent professor of the economic urbanization in the world. He's professor at Harvard. So he's chair of our council. We've got two African mayors, and then there's a sprinkle of other academics like me, but it's a practitioner-focused organization, and the idea is that it's problem-focused. The mayors focus around problem. How do we get tax revenue, for example? What are the lessons from experience elsewhere? What are the choices? What are the pluses and minuses in each choice? How do we get connectivity of the city? How do we get affordable housing? So the whole thing is organized around problems that mayors and people like the governor of Lagos would have to address. So cities that work is a, an open organization that is already working with several African cities. You're welcome to join that network, both as a contributor and as a beneficiary. Right? It's a shared knowledge network. Um, I'm proud to say that the, the governor has um, 
before my talk, he may well have rescinded it, having listened to my talk, but before my talk, he invited me to come back in May, and I'll be honoured to do so. Thank you. The Communications and Public Affairs Director of Lafarge, Mrs. Polashade Ambrose Medeben, please rise and take a bow. And last but not the least, for this round of recognition, His Excellency Dr. Mkem Okeke, Deputy Governor of Anambra State. You're welcome. Sir. Good afternoon to everybody. His Excellency, respected governors, respected professors, all the dignitaries, and my dear friends. First of all, happy birthday to Professor 
for Tommy. It's a, it's a beautiful way to celebrate the birthday, to think for the future for so many people. So nice. So the topic that we have today is, it, it, it has living well into it. And in India, in the Vedic philosophy, they say there are four pillars for a society or a city to exist. And the first pillar is the political and the administration pillar, which has to be strong. And it has all the judiciary also part of it, the policing also part of it. So it is the political and the administration pillar. The other pillar that we talk about is the business, is the economy. Economy of a city, of a society has to be strong for the society to be strong. And third pillar for a society or a city to be strong is the media. Media has to be neutral true picture of the society should be reflected through media and fourth pillar is the faith based organization that is where all the religion and all the spirituality comes in where the human value comes in where the harmony comes in so i see in the panelists here we have experts from the administrations we have governors here we have economists here we definitely have media people also representing here and so many of our friends are here. I will put some focus on this, the faith based organization pillar, the human values. For a city to be happy, to have to, for us to have well-being in a city, we have to address the health in our planning when we plan a city. Can, can I be a little informal and come here? I mean, I'll prefer to be a little informal and be in front of everybody and communicate. Yeah. So the first thing that we have to take care is of health. You know, there is an organization which did a survey in 100 top cities of the world. And the survey they did that how many times a person smiles to become happy in 24 hours. And they found in the different ages, a three to five year old child smiles every 370 times in 24 hours. 370 times was the average. Religion and all the spirituality comes in, where the human value comes in, where the harmony comes in. So I see in the panelist here, we have experts from the administrations, we have governors here, we have Economist here, we definitely have media people also representing here and so many of our friends are here. I will put some focus on this, the faith based organization pillar, the human values. For a city to be happy, to have to, for us to have well-being in a city, we have to address the health in our planning when we plan a city. Can, can I be a little informal and come here? I would, I'll prefer to be a little informal and be in front of everybody and communicate. Yeah. So the first thing that we have to take care is of health. You know, there is an organization which did a survey in 100 top cities of the world. And the survey they did that how many times a person smiles or become happy in 24 hours. And they found in the different ages, a three to five year old child smiles average 370 times in 24 hours. 370 times was the average. They say an adolescent, a young, who becomes 17, 18 year old, you get a mobile phone also today, today's life, right? You get a maybe scooty also, you get admission in a good school also. The happiness should increase. The smile should increase. You know what was the average? 17 times in 24 hours. 
and the next sample they took it was 26 to 30 year old can you guess what was the average this was in the top modern cities of the world whole world zero yeah no that's what that's what we thought that you know in planning our cities we have to take care of this human value aspect the health aspect the harmony aspect and health as per uno today is not just mere absence of disease in the body is not the health is the happy state of the mind is health and planning our cities we have to take care of this how can we build an environment where we grow economically we have a home for everybody we have a strong connectivity we have a strong transport but at the same time we have connectivity from heart to heart in people that connectivity should all also not be should also be taken care because as we are growing in material world material things is this human aspect should not be compromised and other side i will say is the environment side we should be careful because the health of the mind and the environment that we plan for the city should be taken care of what do you say do you agree with me yeah you know that is why in india now in many cities we face this pollution problem a lot we have started garbage enzymes in the metro cities the big cities we are saying all your kitchen waste you segregate plan the governors are here i request them you know from the very beginning in, beginning in the planning can we have something like you know recyclable separate biodegradable separate and then from all the kitchen waste what we are doing is we are creating bio enzymes which can fix the ozone layer that that girl in the un speech she was saying can we fix the ozone layer by producing bio enzymes in india we are doing many city art of living doing this voluntarily project to create enzymes in every home so that we produce ozone that is something we can do you know i am i am on this tour of six african country this time for two months to initiate a project called volunteer for better africa give your one hour for your country you know in planning our city we have to plan where people are ready to be volunteer to do something for the society also not just thinking for yourself what do you say you know first as so we can't do that un unless i am happy you know for me the question of sharing happiness comes moment i say okay i am happy now i can share so the first aspect we should plan is is the holistic health some meditation some singing people you know places i'm very happy to see that in nigeria here people do that they all get together in churches and different places they sing this is very good sign this is something very very positive for a good society where people get together they guess they get less lesser into addictions drugs if you sing celebrate life every day there is juice in life then lesser we get into the evils of the society that we see today what do you say do you agree with me am i making sense yeah so this is what this is what i am proposing all over africa say give one hour for your country some initiative we will take for the society so first do what have healthy cities where breathing is there people do exercises they do they do yoga they do meditation they do now now america is big way in yoga today this every way it's the biggest uh, industry of the yoga in the world is in america because they have recognized it that the the holistic health has to be the part of the urban cities that are coming for tomorrow right so these are the things we should we should also plan right so on this note i will really congratulate all of you and then this is the only point i would like to add the harmony in diversity and the human value of caring sharing you know corruption in a society is because the belongingness is not there
the root cause of corruption is see somebody who belongs to me will will i ever think of doing corruption with that person will i do corruption with my wife or my brother or my somebody whom i love i love my father will i do corruption with my father no somebody when i see that whole city belongs to you everybody the whole society belongs to you me this corruption can be addressed so we when we plan our cities we plan this aspect also what do you say yes. so i'll i'll close on this note that a city, the future city where the well being has to be there the holistic health has to be thought of human values has to be thought of harmony and diversity has to be thought of this is what i would like to conclude with thank you very much thank you anurag arora the next item is a short video of Mr. Paul Cilia, who is the founder and CEO of Dillus. If the video is ready, please play. Give a warm welcome to Paul Siala. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Honoured to be here. Unlocking human potential through your building. Uh, again, when you think of everything that we've heard to date with regards to sustainability, uh, it really has been uh, a green effort. And I would say 80 to 90% of that conversation has been focused on how do we reduce the impact of the environment around us? How does the building become more energy efficient? There have been inklings of conversations with regards to indoor air quality and certain things that impact people. Uh, but well building is, uh, is advancing this um, considerably. Uh, I'm gonna put my Wall Street hat back on for a second. You know, as I started to put a team together formulating uh, doctors to communicate from the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, um, Harvard and Columbia Medical School, as we started to bring in expertise, experts across uh, policy and sustainability, uh, we all recognized that we could have a big impact on, uh, from a social standpoint, if you could actually address human health in a passive manner in, in all these spaces. Uh, but again, thinking, um, thinking with, a, with a Wall Street lens for a second, I also was really interested in this notion of taking the largest asset class in the world, real estate, $180 trillion, okay, largest asset class by far, and infusing it with the fastest growing and arguably most imp important industry in the world, health and well-being. $3 trillion a year annual spend. So you take the largest asset class there is and you merge it with the fastest growing industry and you got uh, this notion of wellness real estate. Uh, economically, this is really interesting, um, particularly if you look at the cost of any building. You know, the green building movement today is about a four to five trillion dollar industry and it's been focused on reducing the cost, the ongoing energy costs waste management, water consumption of a building, which happens to be very low single-digit cost of a building, 5% or less, 2%. And that has spawned a $5 trillion industry. Now, the biggest cost of any building are the people inside of it. Over 90% of the cost of any building is its people. Salaries, wages, benefits, productivity, output. So if green building over the last 15 years can become a four to five trillion dollar industry trying to reduce that, that cost input of something that amounts to two to three percent of a building, I don't know what that means for well building. But it's, it's something that's gigantic and it's something that needs a lot of attention. And what we uh, started with early on was a platform to collaborate and to bring the industry together 
and formulate this process called well certification. Uh, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the U.S. Green Building Council uh, and other GBCs around the world and programs like LEED certification, L-E-E-D. You may see that on the sides of buildings, LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And the U.S. Green Building Council has put that certification program into about 14 billion square feet around the world in 156 countries in the last 14 years. We hope that all of us, for all of our sake, um, that this well notion of well-building is going to mean a lot for all of us. Because again, where we're spending our time right now, 90% of it inside for most of us, it's just not how the human body was built. And we need to start to best understand how to adapt our interior spaces to go back to what the human condition was really meant for and all about. Um, you're going to see more and more evidence of healthy building practices and, and this question, well, do I, if, uh, does a help, healthier building mean more productivity in the corporate environment? We wanted to deconstruct that line of logic. We felt for about five to seven years now, the hot topic is wellness, wellness initiatives, wellness programs and corporations. Okay, great, but let's get back to the science. We felt the industry was making this big leap. Do healthier building practices mean more productivity? And our thought was we need to deconstruct that line of logic. Instead of point A to point D, let's break it down. Point A to point B should be the question, do healthier building practices mean healthier spaces? Point B to C is do healthier spaces mean healthier people? And point C to D are healthier people, more productive people. The well standard is independently validated by GBCI, which is an organization inside the U.S. Green Building Council that has done the same independent third-party verification for, again, 12, 14 billion square feet of lead product. GBCI is now performing the same exact function for well certification as they already do for lead. And the fact that you've got a space that goes through the protocols but goes through a rigorous audit when construction is done where it's a group literally comes and puts a stethoscope on your building, tests the air quality, tests the water quality, measures the circadian lux levels, verifies the operational protocols. So it can actually validate from an output and performance basis, not just an input checklist, yes, I did this, that the building is well certified. That answers that first question. Do healthier building practices mean healthier spaces? Not sure. Is a well certified space a healthier space? Factually, yes, because it's met the minimum precondition set forth by hundreds of industry experts right now at this point through a consensus peer review, defining the parameters and the preconditions required to understand what is optimal for the human lung, what's optimal for our energy levels, what's optimal type of water to intake. So, so bringing fact to this argument and then doing so in such an economically viable way is uh, highly encouraging. So that's what I have for you. I just wanted to, again, introduce you all to the notion of well-building. And um, hopefully, uh, if nothing else, have a look at that body of work um, uh, because you're going to learn a lot. And that's what this really is about, upping the IQ of all of us to best understand how what's around us is impacting us and our families. Thank you. Okay, let's proceed. But just before we do, I know we have almost a row occupied by young students over there. I, I, I know that. I remember sitting amongst them for a while, and they kept addressing me as Ma. Sorry, Ma. Excuse me, Ma. Then I realized I'm old. But, <laughs> but I just wanted to say something while reading Professor Patutomi's um, work welcome address talking about setting up schools of the best of qualities for students who cannot afford them. And while I sat there listening to Professor Paul Collier talking about the kind of Lagos you should anticipate when you're older, and um, I'm thinking 30 years from now, I should probably have accommodations in Lagos. And I would love to say to children who might be sitting around in a row like that, that a school was once talked about that was set up to provide 30 years from now the children 
who would exactly establish that kind of Lagos. And I know that in Lagos State, we're already setting a foundation for that. But what's happening in Enugu State, many of us do not really know because we do not live in Enugu State. We haven't exactly traveled outside Lagos most of our lives. So to tell us a little bit of something, let's welcome Nayelu Go Chidi Aro. He's representing the Enugu State Governor, His Excellency Ifan Yugwanyi. Chidi Aro is the Honorable Commissioner and Chairman of Enugu State Capital Territory Development Authority. And he'll give us a short speech on what's happening in Enugu State and what we need to know here in Lagos. Please, a round of applause as he walks on. A little more, please. It's a long walk. Thank you. I'll just keep helping us on. Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Lagos State, Your Excellency, the Chairman of this occasion, Your Royal Majesty, the New of Affair, distinguished guests, permit me to send the greetings of my boss, the good Governor of Enugu State, Right Honorable Ifan Ugwai the man who presides over the city that is sitting atop the Udi Hills. He sent me with special greetings, first for his friend, whose birthday we celebrate today with this wonderful ceremony. The story of Enugu, I must say, Your Excellency, with your kind permission, is a story of that young girl who is just approaching puberty in comparison to the elder sister who is the beautiful wonderful lady that is now a mother of two the nigeria of today is a nigeria that we've all benefited from the wonderful things of lagos i am Igbo. i have spent my life all over nigeria in my law practice but i know that you can rarely have a city that is as accommodating as lagos you can rarely have a place that is as well run as Lagos. But I tell you where we're going to. Just like the beauty of the elder sister with kids, this virgin young girl called Enugu is coming up with great hope. I bring you this because His Excellency, the governor of Enugu State, who understands that leadership is key to all human endeavor started running of the state at the inception of his tenor with two key principles prudence and the fear of god a combination of these two factors brings about what you hear from everybody that enugu is the state in the hands of god because if you fear god you must manage your resources very prudently in the best interest of your people if you fear God, you must think about the future of your people. His Excellency, since he took over, understood the basis of this new virgin child, where the hope of the people will lie in the future. And so he's done very massive thing in terms of infrastructural development. I am sure that outside Lagos, our elder sister, which we acknowledge any day, any time, no other place in Nigeria in this short time has witnessed the kind of infrastructural revolution that has gone through in Enugu. What His Excellency has decided to do is to create new cities so that it is possible for us to manage the city of Enugu, which by the grace of God, after Lagos, has been named as the second most resilient city in Nigeria by the Rockefeller Foundation. It is in this direction that His Excellency has done massive infrastructural development leading to creation of an entirely new city in the university town of Nsoka. I am sure that apart from the places I've seen in Lagos, I have not seen anywhere in Nigeria that the standard of road done from OP Junction into Nsoka town is being done in the past three years. I am sure 
that the massive housing development which is going on in parts of Osoka and then in outskirts of Enugu, which I'm sure my brother here of the lifestyle and golf city in Enugu will talk about, is not going on anywhere in Nigeria except in Lagos. But you understand something. Why is this happening? Prudence. Enugu is not as rich as so many other states are. But Enugu understands that the human dynamics must play. And that is why Enugu is a state that is not owing one naira salary to any of its staff still today. In Enugu, His Excellency Right Honorable Ifa Enugwai understands the fact that there is no way you can drive development except by the people. Therefore, an all-inclusive democratic government is being run in Enugu that allows full participatory right to everybody. And so at the bottom of it is the fact that he has created absolute peace in Enugu. And I am sure that Enugu is an example of where democracy thrives. That is where all the parties in this world practice proper democracy. If you ask an APC man in Enugu state, he will tell you Enugu is in God's hands. If you ask those of us in PDP, we will tell you Enugu is in God's hands. If you ask the clergyman, he will say Enugu is in God's hands. So the message from everybody is that Enugu is in God's hands. We've not stopped at that. It is important to note that since the inception of this new administration, the basic issues of infrastructural development in the city called Enugu have been taken on headlong. For instance, there's been an expansion in our water reticulation scheme. Right now, when the government took over, those who know Enugu very well will know that most parts of Independence Lao did not have water. Today, I can tell you that 90% of people around Independence Lao to open their taps and have fresh running water every day. In Enugu, the civil service is housing schemes at the outskirts of Enugu to ensure that there's accommodation, that the accommodation deficit in Enugu is dealt with and the place is moved forward. So the story of Enugu, like I say, is a story of people who need to run in on time. Our Ganiro Economic Summit, which was held some time ago, opened up the city to a lot of investors from everywhere. The free trade zone program of the federal government is in effective running around the places in Enugu. And so the challenge to all Nigerians is, Lagos is done massively well, but you need to start running to Enugu now where there is still space so that you can help you. Thank you and God bless you. And I hope that Thank you, Your Excellency. I hope that with those few points of his, he has been able to convince you and not to confuse you why you must vote for the governor of Enugu State for a second term. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now take another short video on CVL impact stories. If the video is ready, please cue and dim the lights. Thank you. My name is Dr. Raymond Osho, a medical practitioner, a managed care expert, and a member of CVL. Well, I've been a member of CVL since 2004. Started when I was in school. That's when I was at Olabis on Emanjo University, um, the College of Medicine to be precise. And um, we started then as students, and I happened to be the coordinator of the club. We grew the club from zero to having the whole school to be members. CVL has impacted my life in one or two ways. Um, firstly, I remember then when I was um, about to go to Lagos Business School to, for the social sector management, sponsored by the Coca-Cola African Foundation and um, African American Institute. I, I was sponsored by CVL to go to Lagos Business School and I went for the interview. I happened to be the only student then. But because of my, the pedigree of the platform which I was coming from, I was able to excel very well in the interview and I was given a scholarship 
to attend um, the Lagos Business School, which I finished in 2010. Secondly, um, Sylvia taught me about what is called volunteerism. Um, then when we were in school, we always believed that we need to get something for everything we do. But as Sylvia mem a club member, then we started going out, cleaning the environment, and doing things, volunteering. Then that actually helped me when I had the opportunity to go outside this country. I, when I was in Sierra Leone, I had to, I volunteered for WHO, and um, I worked with them for over almost 18 months, on, um, and also with um, UNICEF, for immunization, polio immunization, and it actually helped me greatly, I, because I met a lot of people, I was able to learn that service is rendering help without expecting something back in return. And that has been the basis of what I do today. Even in the healthcare industry that I presently work, I see service as one of those important things that you need to give to people without expecting back in return. So CVL has helped me greatly. And um, not only that, the third one, CVL has taught me leadership. Um, everywhere I find myself, I find myself in a position of leadership. And um, most of the time, uh, most of the books that we have read through the inspiration of Prof actually giving us the opportunity and the, the confidence to be able to lead people. Because leading people is one of the greatest challenges of this world. But thank God for the tutelage. And we're still learning. And I'm sure that um, we can't stop learning. Because the day you stop learning, you stop growing. My name is Humphrey Akanazo. I am the country manager of Rome Business School Nigeria and I am a member of CVL Club. I came in contact with CVL in the late um, 2014. Modestus Wallo was uh, the person that introduced me to the Royal Border Forum of CVL. I remember he invited me to come to one of the Saturdays and um, I decided to come and what I saw was really amazing, particularly what I have been expecting to see in Nigeria, a blessing to my life. I came to Nigeria like, you know, for, I was like a dry land, <laughs> you know, I, I came back, nothing, no network of friends. CVL gave me first of all this network of friends. I started making friends. I started also meeting uh, people who are ready and willing to help the younger ones. I, I have never been employed in the Nigerian corporate environment before. And so it was in CVL that I got the first employment of my life in Nigeria when um, Dr. E.J. E. Jidema, a very intelligent and entrepreneurial uh, uh, woman, uh, came to present her life achievements. And after the, the session, I approached her and told her, Ma, look at me, just coming back from Spain. I have my PhD. I'm looking for something to do. But then I would like to learn something from you, even if you're not going to pay me. Let me just work for you and get to know what you do, especially the organizational development that her um, a company does, that is Leading Age Consulting. And she was impressed. She asked me, send your CV. And I sent my CV to her. I wasn't expecting to be employed or put on a payroll, but when I came, she said, Humphrey, I have a job for you. And she gave me that job and I started working for her and I never ceased attending CVL's programs. And each time I attended CVL's programs, which Dr. Jidema always allowed me to go, I kept on meeting friends and friends and friends and started getting bold, finding my feet in, in Nigeria, in the business environment of Nigeria and it gave me that boldness to start planning on how to start my own organization and when i saw that i didn't have the money to start an organization i relied on my contact and in fact 
I am the country manager of Rome Business School Nigeria today because I have people like Uche, um, Achinine, Modestus, Wolo, and even Professor Patu told me, I remember last year when we did our FOB Nigeria, the founder of Rome Business School, the president of Rome Business School, Professor Antonio.